I'm absolutely de delighted to be here today with Kirk Durston. Um, I found Kirk online and I've just been fascinated by all his work. He's got a wonderful YouTube channel. He's got a wonderful blog um, website and uh, just filled with ideas and lots and lots of history. And so um, Kirk, I'm gonna do a little bit of a bio here just so that you kind of know why I wanna talk sure. to him. Um, he has his bachelor's of physics uh, from the University of Manitoba and then a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Manitoba and then an MA in philosophy. That's a big jump. And then after that, a PhD in biophysics. That's the fascinating one, how you went from <laughs> physics, mechanical engineering to philosophy and then to biophysics. But I understand after having listened to you what that trajectory is. And in, in addition to that, Kirk has uh, published a number of papers and just to give you a flavor of the kind of thing he's working on, here's a couple of titles. Um, one is a novel approach to identifying and ranking critical non-proximal interdependencies within the overall protein structure. That was um, published in Bioinformatics Advances. And the statistical discovery of site interdependencies in submolecular hierarchical protein structuring. So you get an idea of kind of what he's working on. Um, I think the whole biophysics angle is fascinating because the, the more we look at all these things, the more they all tie together and they scale. And uh, so I'm really fascinated to be able to start this conversation, Kurt. And um, well, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm sure my audience is going to love you. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about why you went back and pursued the biophysics after you had been in mechanical engineering? Yeah, I um, there was a problem always nagging at me, and that was the origin of life, the diversity of life. And as I watched the discussions back and forth, I thought there's got to be a way to narrow this down, to all these threads must converge somewhere and I want to find where they converge. Like what is the ultimate thing we should be talking about when we're worried about the origin of life? And uh, it seemed to me that information, when I, information was critical here, the kind of information that's digital that can be encoded in things that, that codes for something. And uh, I learned that the DNA that in the genomes of life, there is a lot of information encoded. So the question was, well, <clears throat> how extensive is this? Could it be, you know, just randomly generated? Could there be, um, is it simple? Is it really simple? Like if you dump a box of alphabet characters on the floor, you will get, you will certainly get the word a ah, single letter A, but you can get two letter words sometimes, but just how complex is this information? Is there a way to measure that? Is there a way to actually detect information in things like DNA and RNA and genes and proteins? Is there a way to do that? And, and if you can detect it, then what about measuring it? And what does that tell us about where this information came from? So it was a fascinating thing for me. And I began to explore that. And I gave a seminar somewhere. I don't remember where. And a professor at the University of Guelph happened to sit in on my seminar, I guess. And he wanted to meet with me afterwards. He was in bioinformatics. And he says, I... If you'd like to, I would be, uh, I would be willing to supervise you on a PhD uh, research project to dive into this thing further. And so uh, I said, well, if I can dive into this further, if I'm allowed to really go where, where this seems to be pointing, I'll, okay. And um, so I, that's why I went into it. And the big question was, where did the information come from that's encoded in the genomes of life? Can it be naturally generated? And there's ways to test that out. Or does it come from a mind? Uh, there is a cutoff where if you get too much information, it gets to be really complex and high value information, highly specific. Uh, where does that come from? And there's a cutoff point where uh, the only thing science has on the table right now that can reproduce large amounts of information is as minds. That's, that's all they have. We have stories on how information can be reproduced, but that was part of my PhD research to, well, let's do a grad course on genetic algorithms, for example. Can we write an algorithm that will search for, let's say, 
combinations of amino acids that will code for three-dimensional proteins like what's what's at what's at stake here how hard is it to do i love that course by the way genetic algorithms are amazing but um it turned out the genetic algorithms are not very good for what's called needle in the haystack problems um that's where the solution is so um so isolated in the vast set of all possible solutions and that there's no gradient that'll help you navigate towards the ultimate solution there's no hill climbing uh possibility and so basically it's like looking for a needle in the haystack and that's what it turns out to when it comes to um, the information that codes for three-dimensional proteins so anyways it, it was i had philosophical reasons behind this but philosophical reasons don't really fly in in uh, as far as publishing papers in science journals. So um, it was also fascinating to explore, well, what does this information do in terms of the three-dimensional structure of proteins? And that was fascinating as well. And that's really what I where I focused my the science part of my PhD project in information, detecting it, measuring it, and what does it do in terms of three-dimensional structure for proteins? But in the, the philosopher part of my head says, what are the philosophical implications of what I'm seeing here? Mm -hmm. That's that's really cool. Yeah, that was a. I, I listened to one uh, talk that you did where you went on. You had about an hour and a half to talk, and you did, went through most of that in an hour and a half. So you did a very good job. Just how simple. Oh. That. <laughs> and an hour and a half <laughs> is really too short to, to do do it justice. Yes, yes, I'm sure. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> The way I, because I think there's so many overlaps here that we could talk about anything really, but I wanted to funnel us down into one category. And so I thought we would start first with this idea of um, the, um, the importance of limits. Um, you had a blog post where you were talking about um, the implications of quantum physics. And I, um, interspersed a few comments in the middle of your blog post in my uh, communication with you via email. And I thought we could talk about some of those. But before we did, I wanted to show you a little clip of Stephen Wolfram talking about the problem of observers. And I think you'll see immediately why this connects up. Now, are you familiar with Wolfram's new theory? Of a little bit uh, and a little bit with his new approach to physics. Uh -huh. It sounds fascinating. And I'm a, and I did study quantum, quantum mechanics in uh, my physics degree, but uh, that was a long time ago and mm -hmm. things have proceeded beyond that. Yes, so I, yeah. Well, so in Wolfram's theory, um, here's just a very rough, quick background. His theory is that the there's not a space-time manifold as Einstein said, but space and time are separate. Space is actually um, what everything is made of. His theory is that space is actually space actually consists of minute particles, far smaller than Planck scale, minute particles that he calls eames, and um, and that time is actually the updating of events. So everything starts with one particle and then three particles creating a little grid. And then as that grid gets updated over and over and over again, more and more structure comes out of these particles and the connecting edges between the particles. So the structure is continually building, updated by time. So you can kind of get this picture. You've seen the pictures of the big bang in the universe growing out. And at any moment in time, you could slice across that and take a slice in time. That's the way he sees time as time is all these slices, these updating of events. So this whole thing, this whole manifold that whatever the universe is, he calls the Ruliad because he says that Ruliad, um, he originally thought there was just one simple rule that was generating this whole structure. But now he thinks it's all possible rules operating in all possible ways. And he calls that the Ruliad. Now, I'm not making a statement of whether I think he's right or wrong, but I think there's very interesting philosophical implications in what he's talking about. 
that he hasn't seen yet, but, but he will. But anyway, I wanted to show you this little film clip of him talking about the Ruliad and whether or not the Ruliad is an observer. And I think that, um, I think we'll find it very interesting. It's very brief, it's about two minutes long. Just need to share my screen here. Um, here we are. And I'm thinking you can see my desktop here all cluttered up with yes. this stuff. Yes. Okay. So I see the Steven. video there. You see Stephen now, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Hopefully this is loud enough. Do you think that the Ruliad itself can be an observer? I know we're going back to observation, but I'm curious. Oh boy. Not really. Not an observer like us. See, here's the thing. The one feature of us, and it's another implicit assumption, is we're kind of small and integrated. That is, our minds, you know, by the, by the very idea that we have a, a single thread of experience, our minds are not too extended. If our minds were sort of, sort of vastly extended, we wouldn't have the same sort of sense of coherent identity. So, you know, one picture is about the Ruliad, is we say, let's go explore the Ruliad. Let's go uh, look at sort of, uh, you know, let's go colonize Rulial space. Let's go, yeah, let's go, right. uh, go explore further and further out. And you say, maybe that's the point of civilization. Maybe that's what we're, you know, maybe that's our, maybe that should be our goal, just like we explore physical space, we explore Rulial space, etc. Well, the problem is that when you are sort of holding in your mind all of these different possible views of what's going on, in some sense, it's, but by the time you have all those different views all stuffed together in your mind, there's no coherence to what you think. And so, in probably in, in no meaningful sense can you say that you still coherently exist. You are, you are everything, but you're also nothing, so to speak. In other words, the, the concept of coherent existence, I think, depends on the choice that it is, there are things that are you, and there's lots of stuff that isn't you. If you say you are everything, then in some sense there's no there's no you in that picture, so to speak. Interesting. So, so I think that the you know what what is necessary is that in order to have kind of coherent existence, we have to be limited. That's you know uh, it, it's a I mean a way of thinking about this, a much more formal way of thinking about this in mathematics would be well you know you want to prove theorems in mathematics. You, you know, what you care about is having a limited set of axioms, then building a tower of theorems on top of those axioms. Well, you could say, well, what if you just allowed all possible axioms? You know, then you could prove everything. And why isn't that a good thing in mathematics, so to speak? You can just prove everything. Well, what does that correspond to? In mathematics, it's kind of an old result in logic that as soon as you have something that you consider false, you can deduce anything from false. Implication, the logical rules of implication, given that you start from a false premise, everything becomes true. And at that point, it's like, then, then you've sort of blown up everything. You can no longer make a coherent statement in mathematics. By the time you throw into the things that you believe something which is false, then you can derive everything. Then everything is, in a sense, everything is true. As soon as you know, as soon as you take as a premise something which is false, you sort of have to conclude that everything could be derived as true. And so I, right there at the end, it just strikes me so funny that what he's really saying is, the minute you throw a false conclusion in, like there is no God, then everything is permissible. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, I you know. So, but anyway, at the very beginning there, when he is, uh, when he's talking about how, if you stuff everything inside your head and you have this big picture of how the whole universe is working and there's all these possibilities, it can come to a place where there's too much and it's incoherent because identity requires a limit. Identity requires a boundary, an inside and an outside. And, um, 
But the part where he was talking about all these different things that could be inside a person's head in the way they're thinking is what really drew me to this um, blog post that you wrote about the mind boggling, the possibility of the mind boggling complexity. Um, and I'll just read the first line here of the, this paragraph that I sent you and maybe we can talk about it. You said in your blog post, you said, now here's where it goes to another level of mind boggling complexity. Given the above, at the moment of creation, God would already know all the people he will bring into the world. And thanks to entanglement and temporal non-locality, the state of the wave functions at the moment of creation would be a consequence of all the free decisions humans would ever make along with all the interactions God would introduce to accomplish his purposes. I thought that was a very interesting picture. Um, so I wasn't quite sure in the blog post if you were proposing that that this might be a possibility or that that this is the way some people think, but you don't actually think it's a possibility. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, the reason that I wrote that blog post I have not run into anybody. Uh, the, certainly what I was referring to there is a paper published in, a, in, in research that seems to support the idea that in quantum mechanics, if two particles have a common past and you do something to this particle over here, then it instantly changes the state of that particle over there. So that's basically the, it. There, there's a connection between them that's not, uh, there's an it's extended in space mm -hmm. but the question is are these interactions are as extended in time as well and the papers uh suggest that yes they are that if you do something in the future it actually influences other things in the past that are that if they all have a common history in the past if they say originated let's say from one particle and you had the whole universe explode out of that then everything ultimately has a common history there's some sort of entanglement there. And so if you change just one thing, let's say 8 billion years in the future, that not only changes the state of everything else in, in there that's, that's described by this overall wave function, so to speak, but it also extends backward in time and forward in time. It changes everything. So that's, that's, um, that's the, that's the, the grounds upon which I began to write this article. But the other reason that I wrote the article is I often hear just time and time again that if somebody doesn't understand, let's say, something that God is supposed to be able to do, then God doesn't exist or it 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 doesn't uh, it's false, for example. And the thing that I uh, that I I really want to to challenge is this idea is the assumption they make. And the assumption they're making is that if there is a God, if there is a creator of the universe, then uh, we should be able to understand everything that that God does, that the creator does. And if something doesn't make sense to us, then it's false. And I'm thinking, wait a sec here. Uh, is this, like, what is the IQ of God? Let's, let's think about that for a second. What's God's IQ? Or what are you implying about his IQ? You might say with your mouth, he must be a genius, but that's not really what you're saying. When you challenge, let's say, God's foreknowledge, this is really what we're talking about here. You're saying that you should be able to understand God. So we're not talking about a, a mind here with a really, really high IQ. Because the problem with geniuses sometimes is they often make decisions that don't make sense to the average person. Because they have a whole lot of other things at play. So if you're saying that God's decisions should make sense to you, you're implying he's not a genius after all. He should have an IQ that's pretty close to, let's say, 100, maybe a little higher. Uh, we, we would probably expect maybe a little higher, but not so high that we don't understand why he or how he does stuff anymore. And let's just contemplate. Isn't that a bit absurd to actually think that the creator of quantum mechanics, the one who is the origin of beauty and music and everything else, actually thinks the way you do with an IQ similar? And so what I wanted to do is say, well, let's just take an example. Or let's just take quantum mechanics and this possibility that events that happen in the future instantly change events in the past or that the way that you can actually, there's a change in the overall state of the system. I'm not saying this is true. In fact, I would be surprised if it was. I'm not saying it's true, but all I have to do is say, look, 
if the little bit we know about quantum mechanics suggests that there might actually be a way at the origin of time itself to know everything that's going to occur in the universe and even tweak this a little bit and play around with the five trillion possibilities right at, at the same instant, if that is actually, if we can wrap our minds around how this might be possible in quantum mechanics, then uh, we don't, uh, we, we might be out of place by suggesting that there's no way God can do this. If I can figure out a way and I just got a piece of meat between my ears, if I can figure out a way that, and I'm not even, unlike some people, I don't think God has an IQ of about 115, then what kind of hubris is it of humanity to think we must understand um, everything about God? And if we don't, then that's bogus. Now, that also has a danger. The danger is, is just saying, well, oh, that's too great for us to understand. You know, it's also an escape, okay? It's escape from critical questions. I don't present it that way. It's not an escape. What I have to do is say, wait a sec, even on our own understanding, of at least quantum mechanics, as it appears to us right now, this might be possible. So let's not just write off the creator of the universe knowing about everything that's going to happen in that universe at time zero. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I was listening to... Uh, no, I guess I was reading a blog post from uh, Michael Levin the other day. Are you, you familiar with his work at all? He, he no. does... Uh, <clears throat> you should become familiar with his work. Because there's so many he's, so he's many slot, things well, he should... slotted right into biophysics uh, uh bioelectricity he slotted right into that mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> he has very very interesting ideas and he's kind of a polymath and so he he mm -hmm. he looks at at all things but um his main thing is working on his his uh research is working towards regenerating limbs um trying to and and trying to combat cancer through mm -hmm. this um understanding of bioelectricity but anyway he was writing this thing and and he was responding to questions that people had asked and someone had asked him the question about you know is it possible that mind is everywhere and if mind is everywhere is that an implication that there might be like some level above us and above our mind that is um that could be called God. And he said, I'm a very open person, but he said, I avoid any sort of a theory that says, well, because God did it, we don't have to think about it anymore. We don't have to do any more research because he said, in my mind, everything should be empirically um, Expl explorable you should be able to look at it through an empirical lens and figure out a way to predict or a way to um find some pathway through rather than just saying well god did it so we know so now we don't need to look for answers anymore so i wondered what you thought about that because i mean <laughs> yeah, that is I what happens a lot. a lot with science right <clears throat> i hear that a lot you know if we say god did it then we'll all just put our feet up we don't have to look at that anymore and I'm thinking, why would that logically follow? Let's say if God created life, for example, how does it logically follow that therefore we don't need to explore that? I, it just mystifies me because uh, it certainly doesn't affect me. I do. Uh, I think there is some pretty, pretty uh, persuasive reason. There are some pretty persuasive reasons to think that God does it, that a creator exists, and we could go further, you know, define that, but. Bottom line is that does nothing to dampen my thirst and my quest for knowledge. You see, science is the discipline that we exercise in trying to figure out how nature works. And it doesn't matter whether God created nature or it exploded into existence, poof, out of absolutely nothing at all, which I think is a little observed. And I have reasons for arguing that, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is if God created life, if God did, or created the information that encodes life and how all the methodology that people can argue about that, but if ultimately that information encoded in the genomes of life came from an ultimate mind, it does nothing to thwart my interest in how, well, how does this all work? 
Like when my dad made something when I was a kid, I didn't say, oh, well, dad made that. I'm not interested in figuring that out. No, I absolutely wanted to understand how this worked. So I think that objection I hear it time and time again is, is uh, wow, it's just, it, it doesn't, it, I don't think people have thought through well enough that just because you think you know how or that somebody made such and such that therefore uh, we don't need to figure out how it works. Science is the discipline where we figure out how nature works. And uh, I'm all in. Well, do you think that some some people, and I don't know if he's doing this, but that some people use that as a little bit of a smoke screen to protect themselves professionally that would still allow them to explore avenues that are not very acceptable professionally, but they kind of protect themselves with this little thing of, you know. <clears throat> well, yeah, it, it can be a, like there are certain things that if you say these sentences or you you make this sort of, assertion up front you sort of protect yourself from too much crit criticism or from people thinking you're a little off base mm -hmm. and i see this quite a, quite often in science there was a remarkable paper by eugene coonan so he was looking at eugene coonan by the way is an internationally respected evolutionary biologist well published and he his own research led him to believe that even RNA replication, which is a precursor to the simplest kind of life, is so improbable, we will never hope to witness that occur in the history of our universe, anywhere in the universe. So well, how do we explain that here we are? Well, uh, his solution to that is to propose an infinite number of universes. And if you have an infinite number of universes, then maybe something is improbable if you only get one kick at the can, so to speak. But if you have an infinite number of kicks at the can, an infinite number of tries, then, uh, and the probability is greater than 0.0, .0 absolute zero, then it, there's a good chance it'll happen somewhere, and here we are. So that was his, his theory. But what was especially interesting was the discussion he had with his reviewers in his closing sentence of his paper. And that was, we are very afraid that the people who believe that there was some sort of a mind behind life will take this and use it as evidence that a mind actually created life. And that was, they, they're very explicit and upfront about their fear. And in his closing sentence, he says, so what this shows is that intelligent design, I'm paraphrasing here, the intelligent design of biological life is not, uh, is not an option. Like it's totally not an option on the what basis, on the basis that we have an infinite number of universes. Well, I'm sitting here, and one of the reviewers pointed this out, and he says, you know, this is actually the opposite of what we try and do in science. We try and come up with simple explanations and not appeal to an infinite number of untestable, unseen things to explain this phenomenon over here. We like to have a simple explanation. This is the very opposite of Occam's razor, but you see, if you can say up front to come up with a materialistic explanation, Anything at all is better than maybe acknowledging there's a mind behind the universe, anything at all. But what I find interesting is often in explanations about how did this universe come about, the, say, a multiverse theory, where this universe is the result of, the, say, a quantum fluctuation at the event horizon of another universe and so forth, they, we have matter, space, time, matter, and energy. And so what do they look for to explain this? Something else that's matter space, time, matter, and energy, say a previous universe. But we also have minds in this universe. And what I find interesting is that there's suddenly an inconsistency here. We have material and matter and so forth, so we're fine in the science community with saying, well, maybe there's an explanation outside of this universe or independent of it that's also materialistic or material. But the fact we have minds in this universe, if we were to be consistent, say, well, doesn't that suggest that maybe if we're going to explain minds, that therefore there might be another mind out there from, and that would explain minds here. So you get into a discussion of free will and whether we actually have minds or we're just a brain that's completely determined from the initial conditions of the universe and the laws of physics. Well, and <clears throat> that was one of the things I really liked about your blog post is exploring that whole avenue of um, um, Well, 
you, you've exploded my mind here because there's so many things going off right now. One of the things that's going off is that when you actually go and explore after multiverse theories, what they ultimately finally say is, well, yes, if there is a multiverse, there has to be a universe generator someplace. <laughs> Haven't you made your problem a bigger problem now? Because now you have, you're not just looking for how this universe came to be, but you have to find a universe generator that's capable of generating an infinite number of universes that have different parameters. <clears throat> the whole thing is ridiculous. Well, it is, uh, but it <clears throat> is a interesting point. Um, I remember reading an article by Paul Davies, another theoretical physicist, mm -hmm. who said, even if we postulate a universe, a multiverse, even if we did, and by the way, the multiverse theory has been criticized in the literature now, including Nature, which I would regard as one of the most prestigious science journals in the world. Like if you can get a paper published in Nature, it's kind of like winning a gold medal at the Olympics type of thing. But it's been criticized as, wait a sec, how do we test this? And is this even science? And there's a number of scientists that step forward and say, even go so far as to say, this is a threat to the integrity of science when we propose things that we can't even test. And therefore, this is maybe at best philosophy of science, but it's certainly science fiction. Science fiction doesn't mean it's false. It just means that there's something in the story that doesn't map to reality. It doesn't work in reality. And therefore, don't be expecting an interstellar spacecraft to land in your backyard anytime soon that actually exceeds, reaches the speed of light and goes beyond it. There's some problems with that. But uh, you can write science fiction with, with mathematics too. Mathematics is a kind of language and you can write mathematical models. And that's, I think, one of the things we have to be very careful of is distinguishing the imaginary world of mathematics because we can do a lot of stuff there that doesn't fit to map to reality and reality. And in reality, you can't have an infinite regression going back in the past for because of certain properties of, in, of countable infinite sets. So we know, and this is what Paul Davies pointed out, there has to be a beginning to a multiverse even, to this whole series of universes. It doesn't go back through an infinite regression and by... Uh, amazingly, all that we progress through that infinite series of universes and events. And here we are having a discussion about this kind of stuff. If we have to wait for an infinite number of events or universes to occur before we get to this one here, we will never have this discussion. So postulating a multiverse might work when it comes to um, explaining how we got so lucky to have life in this world or RNA replication, which is what Kunin was concerned about. It might also work when we uh, congratulate ourselves at being so lucky as to be able to live in a universe capable of supporting life, because the odds of that are vanishingly small as well. So it might work for those things, but it still doesn't explain how the whole mess got here in the first place. What instantiated the beginning of the multiverse? You cannot go back. There's a homunculus fallacy it's known as it's an informal fallacy and that is to explain one thing you take that thing and explain use that thing as the explanation for the first thing and you keep going back infinitely far well that's why it's called a fallacy but it really arises out of mathematics countable infinite set theory the possibility of in reality traversing an actual infinite number of universes or a number of years if you wanted to say use those so um yeah, I can't even uh, remember. Oh, one thing I will say about Wolfram, and that is uh, I, when I finished my first degree, which was in physics, I thought I had a pretty good idea how the world works. I was laughably naive. But one thing that disturbed me near in my final year is I was reading a journal about some physics conference and about how personal attacks between physicists who had different theories. I, I was shocked. Like, this is physics. We shouldn't be personally attacking and things get ugly. And so that was my first glimpse that, wait a sec, maybe some of these theories are being held, have strong emotional support, but maybe they're not actually starting off. The, maybe there's a false premise here. Another thing that popped that balloon of, oh, I think we have a pretty good handle of what's going on in the universe was something Stephen Hawking said when he described our current state of physics as a, and I quote, a hastily erected shantytown. It's like, let's put a shanty right here. And once the first guy puts it there, somebody else puts it over there. And, oh, we need a plumbing system. And it's just a mess in the end. And I have suspected for 
a few decades now, there's something seriously, we got off on the wrong step in theoretical physics and we need to go back to square one. So I read about Wolfram's project. Doesn't mean that he's going to solve the problem, but I am happy to hear people approaching theoretical physics from let's, let's go back to square one just for laughs. Mm -hmm. And it might, might actually lead to something, but just for laughs, let's go back and let's just play around totally different ways of trying to understand how the world works. And I think that's commendable. Well, I was really excited about his theory in the beginning when he talked about it being one rule, because as I thought it through and I, and I, I read a lot of his material and listened to him a lot, and I think it's a fascinating theory, but if there is just one rule, that rule would be love. And uh, it would be a perfect picture of how the universe propagated from love. So anyway, you were just too. you were just talking about reality. Uh, you mentioned reality, and that made me think about the um, the lecture that you were doing about living in a world of deception and how we see our way through deception. And at the beginning of that series, you. Um, we're talking about Jesus Christ being the truth. And then you said, when I say Jesus Christ is the truth, what I actually mean is he is the ultimate reality. So how did you make that connection between truth and reality? And then what do you mean by ultimate reality? Yeah. Well, there's one thing in saying that what I'm saying is true. That would be one way of what one that's a that's one statement a person could make, but that's not what he said. He said, I am the truth. Now, I missed this for a long time until I did that master's in philosophy, where we start worrying about true and false propositions. And what is it? There's different theories of truth. And the theory of truth that we most often, let's see, in the day-to-day -day lives that we say we're going to cross the street, it's called the correspondence theory of truth. And that is, a belief is true if and only if it corresponds to reality. In other words, you might not believe in the existence of transit buses, for example, but I, and I have had people say, you know, it's all subjective and everything else. And I say, well, then do you step out across the street when you jolly well feel like it? Or do you check for cars and transit buses? And they always check for cars and transit buses, which tells me that even though what they say, they may embrace something like a coherence theory of truth, where they have this body of beliefs that are all sort of coherent within their own mind, but to function in the real world, they have to they have to conform their beliefs about crossing streets at least and what happens if you get hit by a transit bus moving at 50k an hour They're, they they live by the correspondence theory of truth but the correspondence theory of truth assumes that there is a reality out there and our beliefs need to correspond to that so it's not just a reality of transit buses if we're going to start having discussions on let's say what's morally right and wrong people are going to have false beliefs on what's morally right and wrong under the correspondence theory. So what is moral reality? What is physical reality? If we're going to judge music even, and, and mu what, 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 what's the difference between bad music and good music? And is there a musical reality out there somewhere? And I realize that at this point, some people might think that, okay, Kirk's losing it, but I, I don't think I am. Uh, if I, my favorite description of God is he is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, but the description says he is the origin of every good thing given and every perfect gift. What that means, you start thinking about every good thing given, every perfect gift, what would that be? Well, beauty, beauty, he's the origin of beauty. He is beauty personified. He's music personified. Art, he's the origin of art and love and honor and every good thing you could think of. And so this is why if Jesus said he is the truth, what he was actually saying, and I'm, I'm speaking, as a, speaking as a philosopher here, he is saying that he defines reality. Does he define? That's a pretty bold statement. No, any humanist says they define reality as badly diluted, especially when they die. And then, okay, well, what are we going to do about reality? Because, you know, Billy Bob over here died, and he would define reality. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, when he said he was the truth, it means he's making a claim to define reality. And then when you start looking at his claims, he said, I am. That's that's who I am. I am. And there's a present tense of the verb to be, which was God's name. He's claiming to be the creator of the universe. 
uh, he actually defines physical reality at that point. So when he says, I am the truth, what he's saying is he defined physical reality. So anything we believe in science needs to correspond to that physical reality. What about other realities? Moral reality. Is he actually flawlessly good? Is it is something good if and only if it corresponds to the way the father of lights is? And Jesus said, you know, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot you could say about this. So when I say he is the truth, that means he defines reality. That's what I mean. And therefore, any beliefs, uh, you can measure whether they're true or false by comparing them to the one who defines reality. That was terrific. So um, the way you were describing, I, I made a few notes, a couple of notes here about my own pet theory, which is that the universe is a work of art. Mm -hmm. um, and I came to that conclusion because of study that I had done in the world of creativity and how creativity works in uh, design because in in the design of art throughout history as people have observed works of art that produce this sense of beauty there are certain principles that show up in those works of art it's not necessarily that the artist is thinking oh i had been using this principle and that principle they just show up because that's what beauty is made of it's like beauty is made of some sort of lattice structure of intersecting principles and those principles are unity, harmony, contrast, dominance, repetition, variation, gradation, and balance. And if you could imagine each one of those principles being on a sliding scale and um, intersecting with all of the other principles at some value, um, when an artist puts a stroke of paint on a painting, that stroke of paint has some purpose in all of those intersecting balances in order to produce the final work of art that is uh, representing what was in the artist's mind at the beginning and then bringing it to a fulfillment at the end. And to me, that's kind of the way the universe has been produced, which, which means if, if I'm correct in this, there's some set of principles that are underneath the laws of physics. So the laws of physics isn't the bottom. <laughs> There's a set of principles underneath that are guiding or producing a possibility space so that the ultimate vision uh, is comes into material reality. So anyway, that's that's the thing I've been thinking about. And you a lot of what you just said about beauty and about material reality and musical reality, because music works this way as well, seems to me that every aspect of reality has that fragrance about it of this, mm -hmm. this idea of design <clears throat> yeah i totally agree i i think that uh in fact i have a little website it's on the side it's my photography i love landscape photography and nature photography oh. and what i love about it is there's something it, it uh, it's that there's actually a quote that the invisible attributes eternal power and divine nature of god are clearly seen through what he has made they're invisible attributes so i call my nature photography website invisible attributes clearly seen and it's the beauty that i see there and this is another thing about god i, I want to i'm doing i'm going to do a um, a response video to alex o'connor he raises a very interesting question on the hiddenness of divine hiddenness and why he doesn't believe in god but my response is partly, there's a number of things I could say, but one is, well, what language do you think God speaks? If God is beauty personified, let's just think about that for a second. Now, we're talking about something we couldn't even, like, I get, I get amazed enough at a beautiful sunset or a gorgeous hues on a ripe uh, pear hanging on a tree. I get amazed enough at that. And there's sometimes a longing. I, I can't even express that. But that's just one fragment of beauty. What if we took all the universe, beauty in the universe together and rolled it up into about one meter by one meter by one meter? How amazing would that be? Well, I'd probably have a heart attack. I couldn't handle that much beauty in one shot. Well, we're just talking about a being here who's the origin of that. So if beauty were to walk in the room, and assuming you could actually physically survive, 
in the presence of beauty personified, what language would beauty speak at that moment? And this is what people don't realize. They think that God should make a billboard on the moon or something. They think in terms of what we do to announce our presence. And that's if we're talking about a being who is the origin of love, what language would love speak? And we see it all around this world. We see how important it is. Like you said, love is, and I'm not talking about a warped, like a low view of log. I'm not talking about that. There is a kind of love that grows stronger and more powerful throughout the years. I've been married now for 43 years. It'll be 44 in January, J July. And this is a kind of love. It's not like dandelions on a lawn in the springtime, which live for you know a few days or a week and they're gone. There's another kind of love that grows more powerful and stronger throughout the decades and possibly throughout the centuries and millennia. And so what, what language would love speak in this world? And I think there is love that, that God is actually calling people, but he's speaking all sorts of languages and we don't hear it because we're expecting him to use like English or something or put a billboard on the moon or do something amazing like make the make six moons in the sky on one afternoon or... And that's so, I guess, so simplistic when we start thinking about God. But I, I'm, I lo I'm a beauty hunter. I love beauty. And mm -hmm. this is why I love nature photography, because I, I've never been successful, mind you, in truly capturing the beauty of the moment, because I, I don't think it can be captured on film. I think artists come closer to being able to capture that. I'll look at a piece of art, and it just resonates in my soul. But I'm sure, uh, like I do dabble in art a little bit, and I've never been happy with any of my pieces, nor my... <laughs> that's a good so... sign that you're... That's actually a good sign that you're an artist. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Because, because your vision always outruns your skill. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I, I lament my lack of skill. Well, but it's it's your lack of skill. It's that feeling of lamenting your lack of skill that drives you to build your skill. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that feeling, you wouldn't build more skill. But once no. you've built more skill, your vision is now gone further out ahead, further up and further in, right? Keeps going further. I can make tech like in. technical, I can reproduce something, yeah. but there's more to art than just say uh, drawing a fish with all its scales and it's technically correct. That's exactly no, right. How do you capture I'll give you a lesson sometime because <laughs> I started out that way too, just wanting to capture, you know, what I could see. And yeah. I didn't think I had a single creative germ in my head. Yeah. Um, but I took this class in creativity. And mm. the the key to, to it was that he gave us very strict boundaries that we had to work within. And when you work within very strict boundaries, it just generates creativity. And once you get that thing cranked up, you can't turn off the flow. Wow, that'd be great. I, I'm afraid, though, that now I'd have even more stuff to do, and I don't have time to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and so over my head and my own interests and hobbies and special interests. And Yes, but but trust me, you're a very creative individual. It's there. It, you just may not have found the, the spigot yet, but it's there. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the, this is another thing about the principles I've discovered. It's not just the unity, harmony, contrast, and all those principles, but there is, are these overall principles that govern the process of creativity that you sh that show up everywhere in every aspect of physics, biology, chemistry, constraints are super important. Boundaries and limits are super important for creativity and um, edges and an inside and an outside. And um, <clears throat> there's all these aspects of the process of creativity of, um, adding more information when you need to when you need to find the signal so it's like adding white noise when you need to amp the signal in a radio so that you can catch the you know catch the wave there's all these aspects of the process of creativity that show up all through the scientific landscape so yeah super exciting but anyway we're not here to talk about me i wanted to uh, to go on to the third Oh, by the way, Alex O'Connor, um, why don't you talk to him instead of just doing a response video? Well, I, I would love to. Um, he sometimes... seems like a great guy. A lot of people in our little corner of the internet yeah. have had conversations with him, and he's very open to that. 
I, I, one thing I really appreciate about him is that he seems, it seems to me when I watch him, he's very cordial, he's courteous, and I really appreciate that. And he seems to be a thinker. Mm -hmm. So I think he's the kind of person that I like to sit down with and, hey, let's just talk. Yeah. Now, he's famous. I'm not famous. And so when some no name guy says, hey, why don't we, you'd like to have a discussion? So I thought maybe I would produce a, something thoughtful first that mm -hmm. he could look at. And say, oh, here's Kirk's style. Here's how we we would probably have an engagement. And then mm -hmm. maybe, maybe mm -hmm. we could actually have um, a mutual discussion there. But I, I so, really appreciate. So it, was he saying that because of divine hiddenness, he doesn't believe that God exists? Because... Uh, it was more complex than that. He said, I, I have actually, he, he said, if if God is truly desires all people to come to faith and no one to be lost, uh, then if, or if you seek and you will find, you know, that sort of thing, then we should be able to, if we want to find God, he should reveal himself to us. And he says, I have sought that. And he lists a number of ways that he has done that. And mm -hmm. I, I just take him at his word that he, he's sincere, that he's sincerely done this. But as I listen to him, I think, well, maybe I, 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 I wonder if he's not kind of, the call of God is, he's actually heard the call of God, but he doesn't recognize it. And that's why I want to say, well, here's, here's two or three ways, maybe four ways that we may, that I think everybody hears the call of God, but because we're expecting something over here, or we're finding in church or something that, and we didn't, therefore, you know, God doesn't exist. So mm -hmm. I want to just awaken people. I did this at a debate, a formal debate. I think it was University of Ottawa a number of years ago. I started, so here's an argument for God's existence, and that is if anybody's actually experienced the call of God, then God exists. But And the word actually means that it's not just a figment of your imagination. And so I, I would say now, I, what I want to say is that it's you. You've actually, and that was a very bold move, very bold. But I say, here's different ways that you may have felt the call of God, and I just outlined that. I had some nice art to go with it. And that was one of the most powerful, persuasive, argument if you can call it an argument i uh i i don't like calling things arguments be, if they get people riled up I, that's not my mm -hmm. objective at all i like to i like to tantalize them with things they may have not have thought of before and they really seem to like that mm -hmm. that approach and that's what i want to use in my discussion in my response so he has searched for god god has not revealed himself and he has to conclude that, therefore, this idea that if you seek me, you will find me, that's just made up. And I can't fault him. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on in his head, but mm -hmm. I liked his argument. I think it's a good one. And uh, he seems to be sincere. And so I would like to give a sincere possible three or four ways that maybe he has, God has answered mm -hmm. his search. But he hasn't well, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I will be very eager to hear that video. That sounds really exciting. So um, my third question is, um, in, in this little corner that we inhabit, which you may not be familiar with the background of- I've heard of it, there's actually. A, there's a flotilla of, of websites, yeah. of YouTube channels kind of connected together. And- uh, we're roughly connected with Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray and Tom Holland and some of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been on various channels and we're all kind of following all these ideas. And these are people who strongly, who say they strongly want to believe that, that there is a need for faith in the world because we're living in a world of deception, obviously, and a, a world of challenge and struggle and if we don't have a center, we're going to be very vulnerable to author authoritarian leadership. Um, but they themselves just can't seem to get to that place. Mostly, I think, because they can't accept the resurrection. I think that's the sticking point for some of them. But, but certainly the idea of miracles is very uh, challenging for them. So... How would you approach that question with such people? Yeah, that's a 
It kind of depends on the person. There are two, right off the top of my head, there's two major different approaches that I might take depending on the individual. Uh, the first approach is uh, maybe more of a scientific one. And I say, look, uh, we know that nature had a beginning. It has to have a beginning. The properties of infinite set theory says when applied to reality means that there is a beginning. And so uh, what is it that caused nature to come into existence? So we only got two options. One is it's either natural or it's not natural. Those are the two major categories. That's what's called a true dichotomy. Now, just as a woman cannot give birth to herself, so nature cannot bring itself into existence. And we only have two options, and one of them is logically impossible. That is, nature cannot bring itself into existence. And the other option, no matter how much we might want to resist it, has to be true. And therefore, we we logic requires a, a non-natural, or we could say supernatural, origin or foundation for physical reality. So it should not surprise us in the least. If logic requires that there's a supernatural foundation for nature, that maybe that supernatural foundation pokes into nature here and there. We might actually expect that from time to time. That's one approach. So they, just to say, well, have you considered this? Another approach is the one that C.S. Lewis took when he talked about uh, rational thinking. And this is one I've been a, very much involved in for the last year or two. And uh, it's almost so simple that it can't be understood, if that makes any sense at all. It's like being lost in a thick forest and all you can see is trees. You can't see the forest because there's just too many trees in the way. You can't. So here's how it goes. And this is a discussion right now. Sabino Hassenfelder has got a video out, which I responded to, arguing we don't have any free will. Everything you think you decided is just basically determined from the initial conditions of the universe and the laws of physics. So, uh, but nobody works that way, including Sabina herself. In fact, she gave an argument, a logical argument. And uh, that's nice, but you can't, you see, there's two ways you can arrive at a conclusion. Um, let me try and make this as clear as I can, because I've never been that successful thus far, but let's give another world at it. There's two ways you can arrive at a conclusion. One is your conclusion was determined by the laws of physics and the initial conditions of the universe and everything materialistically followed from that. So this discussion, every word we say, even when people argue that I'm wrong, and, and when I posted my response, a lot of people argued that I was wrong. And I, I said, well, like, how much sense does this make? It's like two rock piles at the base of a cliff. Both were completely determined by nature. And you ask which rock pile is right and which is wrong. That's an absurd question to ask. They're just physical outcomes. Um, now, the other approach. So the other option in when we make a decision is that we use premises and we use axioms of logic like the principle of non-contradiction or the law of non-contradiction the um the principle of logical inference and then we can arrive at this conclusion like if this is the case then this follows well this is the case therefore that is true and that conclusion was determined by things we call axioms their first principles and these axioms are not just something we can we make up, like we can make up axioms. But when we look at this world, we see, well, most of the ones we would make up are <clears throat> don't fit reality, but there are some that do. The law of non-contradiction does. So either you arrived at that conclusion determined by the initial conditions of the universe and the laws of physics, or you can actually utilize axioms of logic and mathematics to arrive at a conclusion or an answer. Have you considered what that implies? That's my question to the individual. Because your decision was not determined by the laws of physics. It was determined by axioms. And where are these axioms? They seem to actually exist because they determine so much. Speaking about rules for the universe, there are, seem to be some fundamental axioms. And one of them is the law of non-contradiction. But yet they themselves are not natural. They have uh, gravitational fields have no effect on them. The temperature, 
whether they're on the surface of the sun. In fact, it's almost absurd to say this axiom is sitting on the surface. There's another reality out there that is composed of something very real, but it's completely non-material, and that is the axioms uh, that we use in basic mathematics and which we derive all our mathematics from or that we use in logic, logical inference. And so that's my second argument for the existence of the supernatural. And this is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, you see miracles happen all the time, all day long. And that's your ability to make rational decisions that are not determined. In fact, you can override. Somebody, somebody wants to torture you or put a gun to your head to change your mind. Well, you might change your mind, but on the other hand, you might not. And history has many examples of people, no matter what, how much they wanted something, no matter how much they were forced, they still decided, no, this is not morally right. And there was a moral axiom that they used, not the laws of nature. And then they made their decision. So someday, hopefully not too distant future, I figure out a way. I thought C.S. Lewis did a pretty good job, but it's obviously, you know, has figured out a way to make this clear to people that there is a supernatural. We should not be in the least surprised at miracles because your, even the rational argument you just presented me to argue that there's no such thing as miracles depends on is a supernatural feat using axioms of logic. And you just use the supernatural to argue that there was no supernatural. So your conclusion has to be false. Well, can I, I'm going to put a little thing in your, in your idea there because, because there are also people who are dedicated Neoplatonists who mm -hmm. think that that's enough and that there's no need to, to have God. So yes, they would accept that there are axioms and that there are mathematical realities and all these things that are in a sense, supernatural outside the natural realm that don't respond to gravity. They would agree with all of those things, but then they yeah. would still say there's no need for God. And that's the one that I have a hard time understanding. Mm -hmm. Like how, how does your universe work then if there's, where where do these things come from? This mathematical reality that exists outside the the, the plane of material mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? I, I I those are the people. When I listen to those people, I just want to hit my head against the wall because they're very very smart people, and there's probably yeah. something I'm missing. I think it's something they're missing because I have I have discussed this with uh, and. and with some very intelligent people. And I say to them, you know, you've got almost everything there for a mind, except a mind, except the ability to make decisions, intentionality, self-awareness. You've got everything there. Why is it that you're denying that, especially when we've got minds running around here in this universe? So if, to use Plato's, um, you know, his uh, the, the kind of picture he presents is that whatever we see here, there is this ultimate form this ultimate essence out there it's been a while since i studied plato so his terminology is a bit rusty but there was a form or an essence in this in this platonic realm and that is the ultimate chair for example why not the ultimate mind secondly when we look at this universe and see how incredibly fine-tuned it is for the purpose of supporting life it suggests that this universe was was designed well, basically, when you build something, you have an intention for it. And the moment you have an intention, which this universe seems to be intended for supporting life, we're no longer talking about platonic entities here. We're talking about a mind that is capable of intentionally doing something or causing something. So we have a mind with intention, and that suggests that this is not just a, there's not just a platonic foundation for the universe. The other thing is, what about and I think you sort of alluded to this just now, creative abilities. Like you can have this platonic reality out there, but why have the material world? What's the point? Like how would that create or bring into existence the material world? Then you have to say, well, okay, let's let's design, let's postulate they have some sort of causal effect that produces material things. And at that point, I, I, I say, well, aren't you just making stuff up to, you know, ad hoc to try and explain reality? While you're making stuff up, what about the mind here that you and I have? What is the ultimate platonic mind out there? Do we have a bunch of them or is there just one? And, and there's things that I think need to be thought through very carefully 
that suggests that it's not enough just to have the platonic realities, the forms, you know, like ultimate beauty, or you know, these axioms and so forth, that there is actually uh, a mind out there. Then what you see, here's the other thing. Axioms are only useful to minds. So if you're going to ask me, where's the ultimate dwelling place and origin of axioms? Uh, it's almost pretty obvious, I think, that if they are only useful to minds and the best explanation for the origin or the final, the ultimate repository of axioms is an ultimate mind itself. That would be one of my favorite arguments that axioms are only useful to minds. Same with moral axioms, mathematical axioms. If they're only useful to mind, then the best explanation is they came from a mind. There's an ultimate mind out there from which the axioms originate since they're only useful to minds. Well, I think that brings us to our fourth and final question, if we have enough time. And that would be that you did this lovely little uh, video on um, how both the Bible and DNA are good examples of redundancy and flexibility. And I just thought it was a super interesting discussion. And um, given my own ideas <clears throat> and, and your ideas about beauty and the kind of lattice of uh, principles and axioms that make up the possibility space for beauty, I guess you'd say. This whole idea that, that when something is designed for purpose, there has to be enough flexibility in it to manage um, harsh conditions. And, but you explained it much better. So I wonder if you could just talk us through that. Sure. Well, um, I have had many discussions with, with some of my Muslim friends, and one of their arguments in favor of the Quran versus the Bible is that the Quran is word for word, letter for letter, the same in all versions wherever you go. Uh, no, we could talk about that, but I prefer not to because I don't want to put people on the defensive. My response, and then they will point out, well, look at in your manuscripts, some of your Bibles, you'll see these little references in the side and say some manuscripts say this or some say that. When you start just looking at the manuscripts, you'll see that occasionally there's a spelling difference, there's a missing word, or maybe one word was written in twice and so on and so forth. But there are thousands of manuscripts. But um, here's the point, is that, let's go to DNA now. There are, I, I think this world was a, was originally flawless in beauty, but God seems to say that somehow it's become enslaved to corruption. Still, the beauty still is there. The remnants of this, of everything that's good and right and pure is still in this universe. The aroma is still there, but there's a lot of things going wrong. And these lot of things going wrong can affect the, your DNA. And that causes what we call mutations. There are mutagenic factors uh, and there's certain copying errors that can occur and so on and so forth. So with each generation, we accumulate more mutations. So I have roughly anywhere to 50 to 90 mu more mutations than my father and mother did. And my children have even more mutations than I do, my wife and I. So how in the world are you going to design something so that it can survive in a, an environment that's taking hits? It's taking hits all the time. You now, I also was an engineer. And I uh, used to work for a major company producing aircraft engines, and I was an experimental test engineer. And that's the same thing. You can't, people would say, why don't we design something with flawless, extremely fine tolerances and everything else? No, you don't want that because the finer the tolerance is, the more vulnerable it becomes to getting destroyed or seized up or a problem. So you want to make it, design it such that it can survive in an environment with a wide variety of environmental conditions and maybe some dust and dirt and whatever else and still survive and work or at least get you back to the airport if it swallows, let's say, a, a Canada goose in the intake. So uh, here's, the, here's the problem with God. He creates life. He downloads the information into the genomes of life, however you want to describe it. But it's going to be copied over and over again. And every time it's copied, there's going to be mutagenic factors and so on and so forth. So it has to be designed with the capability of still producing a viable human being for centuries, for millennia, despite all the mutational load I already carry. 
And uh, what if God also gave us, for example, the Bible? And he knew that people are going to be copying this, and some guys are going to have a bad day, and they're going to copy the same word two times, and other guys will make a spelling mistake here or whatever, and you get mutations in the, the manuscripts over time. Well, he would have to design it such that there's built-in redundancy. The really important stuff, like, say, the life of Jesus, you get four accounts of that. Uh, there's also other ways to build in redundancy, and that is you don't talk about the really important things just in one section, because what happens if part of the Bible is missing and it's that section that's gone, and now what do you do? You'll find, like with a physics textbook, for example, if you want to know about something in particular, you look at the table of contents, see the chapter that discusses that, then you go to the chapter, and it's all right there. Not so with the Bible. It's all over the place. So you can randomly take out a section here, and just randomly there, and chances are you're still going to get the main idea from the text, the most important idea, which is basically that we've been created by God to have an everlasting relationship with him uh, by putting our faith in the one who came, who is God, and paid the ultimate commit, or basically satisfied the demands of flawless justice to then satisfy the demands of flawless love. So that's the maybe the main message. People might tweak it differently or whatever, but... It has to be built with the same thing. And that's what, exactly what I noticed between DNA and the Bible, that both have been built or designed such that they're being copied over and over again and accumulate errors in the copying, and you'll still get a viable result. And the interesting thing about even with all those uh, different manuscript differences that we see, not one, not one affects uh, an area of Christian doctrine. There's not a single area of Christian doctrine that's affected because each Christian area of doctrine is discussed in different places and different sections. And if this section is missing, you get it over here. Same with DNA. Like a very obvious one is if I got a problem with my father's DNA, my mother's DNA cuts in or vice versa. So there's a defective gene on one side. Chances are the gene in the other side of the parentage is up and running and I can keep going. And it's just amazing the redundancy within DNA and the error repair. There's ways to repair that error. Same with the manuscripts. There's thousands of them. And even if we get a really bad one by a sloppy guy, there's thousands of others we can pretty easily say, okay, that, that guy was having a bad day because we got 750 over here that all say exactly the same thing in this particular passage. So it's built. It seems to be designed to be able to be copied over and over again with typos and everything and still accurately communicate all 100% areas of important Christian teachings or any Christian teachings, not important or otherwise. The other similarity that I see between um, Bible and DNA is that um, the more you drill down, the deeper it gets and the it, it just expands out more and more and more. So you get down to even just one word. And I had this experience the other day. I was reading, um, I was reading a liturgy of the hours every morning. And that liturgy of the hours that I'm using every single day has you read through the passage in uh, Luke chapter one in Zechariah's song, Luke chapter one, verses 68 through 79 where Zechariah is prophesying over the baby John that's supposed to come to him and Elizabeth. And in that song, he makes a statement that, that there will be one who comes to set us free, free to worship God without fear. And I thought, well, that free, I don't remember that for that word being in that verse, because I've read it usually in other translations. And so I went back to the uh, New American Standard and I looked at that passage. And in the New American Standard, it says, and he has redeemed, he will redeem us. And then a little bit later on again, when it when this uh, liturgy uses the word free, it says he will rescue us in the NASB. So it uses redeem and rescue. So, okay. So I went back and I looked at the Greek. That word redeem has the meaning, which, I mean, we're mostly familiar with this idea to pay the full redemption price for the slave and buy the slave back so that now, now the slave is back, the, the servant is back with his owner. 
Um, but when you drill down into that word, I think it's ruosis or something like that. There's two parts or, or there's two threads that are connected to that in the Greek. One of them is ru and the other one is rusis. And the ru comes from a word for flow, meaning like a current of water. And the rusis is the word flow, meaning like a current, a, a flow of blood, which is only used three times in the New Testament. And that's when it talks about the woman who had for 12 years had a flow of blood and that Jesus healed her. So when it says that he redeemed us, he redeemed us with a flow of water and a flow of blood, both the living water and the blood. But when the spear, when the spear pierced his side, out came a flow of water and blood. And that's captured in that word, that Greek word that means redeemed. Now, who could imagine that? No human being could come up with writing something like that using a particular word that is in a prophecy that then would be fulfilled in the actual death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the purpose being redemption. Blew me away. Just blew me away. But I find that so often if I go after just one word, it just get magnified and magnified and magnified. And DNA is like that, too. The deeper down you go, the more amazing it gets, right? Oh, it's incredible. Incredible. Like some scientists have said, we may never fully understand uh, the full extent of what's going on in gene regulation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Craig Vent Venter, who was the first guy to actually decode uh, the genome. He says, we need to start looking at uh, the genome as multiple computer programs. This is computer code. And it's not just like when we write a computer co program, it might be running from start to finish. There could be thousands of programs that are literally running in your genome simultaneously, all talking back and forth to each other to determine the direction of cell fate and so forth. It's, it's really impressive. As an engineer, I think... I think if people, let's say if biologists did a degree in engineering first and then went into genetics, we would live in a very different world. It would be a very different perception of what's going on there in biology. And it's the same, like you said, with the Bible. I, I've read literally I, thousands of books. I, I really was, and I was addicted to reading in school. It's all I did in grade school. And consequently, my marks suffered because I read all day long. Uh, I got into trouble a lot for reading, but there is only, there are very few books I'll read twice, very few, but there's one book that I have, it's the Bible. I started reading it when I was eight and a half, just on a daily basis, writing in my journal, things that I'm learning. So I started when I was eight and a half and I have read it pretty much every day and studied it. And then a few years ago, I decided, man, there's just so much in here. I'm going to have to read this through a little bit more often. So now I read it through the last number of years. I've been reading it through about every nine months, nine to 10 months. Well, when I started doing that, I saw, oh man, there's a whole nother layer of correlations here I never saw before. So it becomes like a giant, it's not a one dimensional thing anymore. It's not just like, remember these five things and then you're good to go. No, it's all interrelated. And this is one of my beefs with some young guys that I've run into a lot of young men who they want to take a shortcut. They want to understand it all. So they buy a book on systematic theology. They read it. And then they spend the rest of their lives trying to make the Bible fit that. It's not that it's wrong necessarily or wrong about everything, but it's more like a stick man. So when a person first starts drawing pictures when they're a little kid, they might draw a stick man. But that's not really, if you stay there, there's a lot of room for development. And this is where a lot of people don't realize that endless layers of incredibly fascinating correlations and interactions within the Bible. We might talk about this thing here, but it's related to seven other things over here. So it's just a the most amazing book I have ever studied in my life by far. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. This has been, this has been fasc fascinating, Kurt. I Thank you so much for being willing to take the time. I know that your life is incredibly busy and I feel honored that you took the time to talk with me. Oh, so. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. It really was a pleasure. And uh, thank you for 
hosting me on your program. I hope we can talk again someday because um, sure. I've, I've done a lot of episodes on Shannon's um, information and mm -hmm. how that connects up with entropy and how that might connect up with the origin of life. Yeah. And uh, and it would be really fun to talk about that with you because I know you've really yep. drilled down into that and you've been working on a paper that you're set to publish soon, I think, right? I've, I've done all the data. I got all the research. I just need to write it up. And the question is, how do I write this up? Because uh, there may be some people don't like what the data has to say. And sometimes if you submit a paper for review, it really depends who the reviewer is. So I'm putting a lot of thought in how do I write this up? How do I write this up? But if I, it's kind of the culmination of all this information and functional information as defined in the scientific literature and uh, pretty serious implications with regarding the origin of life. Well, there are, um, one of the things that Michael Levin had been talking about recently is that most of his new papers that he's putting out, and I mean, he has a lot of peer reviewed work, but most of his new papers that he's putting out now, he puts out in these, what they call pre preprint, is that right? Yeah. Preprint publications? Yeah. Um, to get it out there because he says he knows there's going to be a lot of pushback. So you might as well get it out there and get the pushback going. <laughs> yeah. Well, ideally, so, I'd like to get it in a peer reviewed journal, but uh, you could certainly publish it in a place like Archive, for example. Yeah. And uh, in the end, I might might do that, but uh, I'm thinking the case is getting stronger and stronger all the time, even with what other scientists have done since I did my PhD research that complements and correlates what I've looked at. So um, some of the objections, uh, there's two main ones that I want to deal with in this next paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, I have another paper per, that I've been involved with another team of scientists that's hopefully the next one out there, but that has nothing to do with this. It's more like mm -hmm. just pure protein science, mm -hmm. which which would be a good thing that if you can't fall asleep at night, you read that paper. Well, for everybody who's still listening at this point, if you want Kirk to get that paper finished, put a comment. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> It might nudge him a little bit. <laughs> I feel bad enough as it is, it's been so long. Well, I mean, if, if it goes on too long, you'll forget what it was you were about. So, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll be a good thing to get it done. Yeah, um, it would be. Because I know, I know for myself, I've been wanting to write up this idea of mine for five years, but I keep exploring more and more and more and more. And the more I explore, the bigger the idea gets. And now it's so big, I couldn't begin to write it down. So, I hear you. I should have written it down you. in the beginning, right? <laughs> I hear you. The more you dive down this, uh, look, you know, I don't know how you would, what the metaphor would be, but you step through that door and it's a room with a lot of other doors. And then the next thing you know, this thing is completely out of control and you're onto something huge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for a delightful day. And I look forward to speaking thank you. To you again. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.